Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we know uh, um, you all are joining from different parts of the world. My name is Pratip Nayak. I'm at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I'm uh, representing here the Vulnerability to Viability Global Partnership uh, that works on strengthening small-scale uh, fisheries around the globe. The purpose here is uh, to uh, uh, join uh, the B2B Global Partnership Thematic Webinar Series. I will make a few introductions before I invite our speaker for today to speak uh, 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 at the webinar. Uh, I will first introduce the B2B Global Partnership uh, and we will proceed from there. The B2B Global Partnership is a transdisciplinary research and knowledge network with over 100 members from Asia, Africa, Canada, and internationally. The goal of the Global Partnership is to support small-scale fisheries in their transition from vulnerability to viability. And the way we understand uh, vulnerability and viability is not just in the economic sense, but it also includes you know, the political, the cultural, the, 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 the ecosystem or the natural and other aspects of uh, small-scale fishers' uh, lives and identities. The V2B Global Partnership aims to identify the diverse factors uh, and conditions contributing to the vulnerability of small-scale fisheries and engage collaboratively with small-scale fishing communities around the globe and other key NGO, government, and university partners to enhance small-scale fisheries viability. We are conducting transdisciplinary community-engaged research in six countries of Asia. That includes Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, and Thailand, and six countries in Africa, Ghana, Malawi, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. In doing so, the V2B Global Partnership brings people and organizations together uh, across physical, cultural, and disciplinary boundaries through a shared interest in addressing global climate uh, change impacts on small-scale uh, fisheries. The V2B thematic webinar series uh, for which we have gathered here today uh, is an in, uh, in, uh, initiative of the B2B Global Partnership to facilitate and generate high-level discussions on vulnerability and viability topics and themes within the context of small-scale fisheries. The goal is to feature academics, policy practitioners, and members of the civil society who have made significant contributions to the theoretical, practical, and policy aspects of small-scale fisheries, both locally and globally. The B2B uh, web thematic webinar series takes place on the last Friday of every month, and it will be so uh, in the rest of 2021. The series is available internationally through live streaming on the YouTube. Details regarding the monthly webinars, including speakers, topics, and titles, and links to webinar platform is available at our website, which is www.b2bglobalpartnership.org. Today's talk is the 10th in the series of webinars planned for the year 2021. And it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Cornelia Noen as our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Noen has a PhD in fisheries science and marine ecology from Kiel University, Germany. Since 2010, Dr. Noen heads the international nonprofit known as the Mundus Maris focused on sustainable living with the ocean and supporting small-scale fisheries. Under her leadership, Mundus Mary seeks to combine scientific concepts with participatory research, arts, and practice embedded in local, mixed, and global cultural spaces in Africa, Europe, and elsewhere. Earlier, Dr. Nawin worked in FAO, Fisheries Department, and later, in the International Science Cooperation at the European Commission. She also chairs the Board of Trustees of Quantitative Aquatics, a scientific nonprofit in the Philippines, where she hosts and develops fish base and other open access information systems, particularly related to small scale fish base. Dr. Nawin's current research interests focus on sustainable small scale fisheries, including the essential gender uh, dimensions. 
Our work also supports the implementation of the small-scale fisheries guidelines as part of sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Dr. Nawin sees critically engaged science and arts as among the most promising approaches to support transitions for sustainable living, thus supporting active participation of citizens, private and civil society organizations, as well as government at various levels. I'm extremely proud that Dr. Nowin is also a collaborator and pa active partner of V2B Global Partners. It is my honor to invite Dr. Cornelia Nowin to deliver a talk for the V2B thematic webinar series today. And her talk is titled as the Small Scale Fisheries Academy as a source of operational support to the SSM guidelines. Over to you, Dr. Nowin. Thank, thank you, uh, Pratip, uh, for <laughs> this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, it humbles me to listen <laughs> to all of these, uh, um, well, uh, this long list of uh, um, things attributed to me. Um, and um, it's a great privilege, I must say, on my side uh, to be able to be a partner together with uh, all the colleagues in Mundus Maris and uh, to contribute to the goals of uh, the V2V uh, partnership. And um, so let me go straight into Medias Race. Uh, do you, first of all, do you see uh, on the screen uh, the um, the uh, video show version, or do you see part of my? No, my if, you, if you can make it uh, into the presentation mode, please. Because when I think when you uh, started to, um, yeah, because it slideshow, it disabilitated, I think my, my slideshow mode. Uh, how can we do that? Um, I don't know. Um, well, we'll get started and see what, uh, how we uh, get through the slides. Let me start with an acknowledgement. Uh, uh, that is close to my heart. And uh, the first is for Ali Usal. Uh, he's a social anthropologist uh, in Senegal and a long-term associate in many action research activities and a co-author, multiple co-author. Um, and he's also a partner and a co-leader of one of the uh, uh, case study um, research uh, areas of B2B, and uh, Maria Fernanda Arais Trevner. Uh, with her many years of field experience, she epitomizes the key characteristics of what I would consider an excellent facilitator in change processes at uh, community level. And that is the practice, what she preaches to be credible and authentic a great capacity to listen and speak with people rather than talking down to them and uh, to practice and maintain an attitude of learning from one another. So we were lucky um, uh, to have this trio work together on the first development steps of the uh, Small Scale Fisheries Academy. So uh, please join me then on this journey uh, in which I would like to share some empirical experiences with you on how it is possible to act on the rich analysis and diagnostics of uh, small-scale fisheries academies which populate the scientific literature and their social, environmental and economic embeddedness uh, with a view to enabling solutions um, to the many challenges uh, small-scale fisheries are facing around the world. So the journey started well before we actually had this somewhat bold idea of uh, uh, in launching a, a small-scale fisheries academy. Um, more than 10 years ago, um, uh, and well before the academy idea emerged, we've been working 
uh, already on making research results uh, from different areas of knowledge exploration and development um, more readily accessible uh, to people irrespective of their level of formal education and to intertwine that uh, with respect for and celebration of local cultures. Um, just to show one example, uh, starting in 2011, we developed a 40 FAO um, project, uh, Fridge of Nansen, um, a toolkit for schools in West Africa about the ecosystem approach to fisheries. And it turned out actually to be uh, interesting, not only to the schools, which had helped also to develop it and were then keen to use it, um, but we figured out that it was actually quite interesting as well to some of the leaders in, uh, in small scale fisheries, to some of the tra fish traders, uh, et cetera. And just by way of example, uh, one of the tools in the in the in the kit uh, was constituted by a fish ruler showing the minimum length of a major commercial species, so that you could harvest them forever. Um, and here you see Aliu in action in one of the marketplaces to measure fish to figure out whether they had already reached um, uh, maturity size. So we've been working uh, with people in all segments of the value chain in small scale fisheries. You see the, the fishers, uh, the people loading, unloading the catch, uh, the transporters, the processors, uh, uh, major fish traders here in the Dhaka Central Market, and the many women uh, working as traders or processors or micro vendors in the, um, in the sector. Uh, later on, of course, um, as a result uh, of uh, broad-based international consultations and negotiations uh, brought in, these brought into being the, what I would consider a generally uh, favorable global framework um, for in the form of uh, the voluntary guidelines uh, for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication, which are obviously so much at the center of this talk and of uh, the B2V uh, partnership. And um, of course, uh, embedded also into the wider framework of the uh, interconnected sustainable development uh, goals, covering the safeguards of the essential biosphere, um, setting societal targets for justice and human rights, as well as for mechanisms in making the economy work for achieving of, uh, of the goals. And last but not least, very crucially, um, asking for international partnerships to make it all happen and make the uh, goals achievable. And we've been then working uh, as best we could um, in line with our field work and our experiences there to break down those goals, those, um, and to make, uh, to work in ways that make those larger uh, frameworks uh, possible to experience for people on the ground. Because we figure that um, there was a need to uh, strengthen the capabilities of people on the ground to articulate uh, what that could mean for them, and to be active participants in shaping the implementation. Um, in this context, we obviously drew a lot on uh, 
research results available in uh, many spheres of the sciences. And I'm highlighting just one uh, um, and look, and we've been using these, trying to break them down uh, in ways that they became useful means uh, in support of um, uh, the planning of uh, local and other actors. Uh, here I show this one example of uh, the Sea Around Us initiative that uh, reconstructs marine catches to improve on FAO statistics compiled from national uh, records. What you see here is um, that the dark, the dark blue is the uh, industrial catches. Uh, the light blue are the artisanal catches and the orangey tones are the recreational and subsistence catches. The black line here shows the official records that the national authorities, the national accounting system reports to the FAO. But the independent scientific uh, reconstructions uh, illustrate that in the case of Senegal for long periods, um, the actual extractions from different fleets were probably as much as twice as high as the official records. And uh, in the last year available for which data are available, um, you see that uh, we, we saw that uh, two, about 250,000 tons were reported while uh, 312,000 tons were unreported. That obviously has major uh, repercussions on management, on resource assessment, and on how the fleets are doing socially, economically, and so on. And what you see very clearly is that uh, since the late 90s, catches have been declining, and uh, so has the profitability of the uh, small scale fleets as illustrated in several um, uh, publications. Uh, so that was, um, uh, is one of the examples for how uh, one can utilize uh, and, um, scientific uh, publications and, and products uh, to bring to the attention of the actors in the in the sector. And uh, so that also spurned the idea, given that we had um, by, by the, uh, 9, 2014, we had uh, the adoption of the small scale fish, uh, fisheries guidelines. In 2015, we had uh, the adoption by the UN of the SDGs. And so the idea was, it is time to bring it under one platform, under one roof, uh, converge different activities which so far had taken place more in project mode or on in the individual activities. And so um, thanks particularly also for the enormous effort of ALU on the ground, we brought together uh, some 60 participants, men and women uh, from all parts of the country, different professions, organizations within uh, small scale fisheries, value chains, different age groups, the administration, people from academia and civil society. And all together we met to uh, launch and inaugurate the Small Scale Fisheries Academy at the end of 2018. Um, because of the great diversity of uh, the people uh, who were meeting, um, and because, um, as you all know, 
uh, small scale fishers operate very often and very largely in the informal economy, even though uh, in the case of Senegal, there are multiple state sponsored um, organizations, traditional and professional forms of, of associations active uh, covering different segments of the sector. Uh, nevertheless, it is a constant challenge to ensure um, that everybody is informed about the laws, the regulations and guidance adopted by the government such as the, uh, the, the SSF guidelines. So making sure that all participants had the, all the necessary information was critical for enabling everybody to contribute uh, equitably uh, to the formulation of practical priorities for the, for the academy. So what did we do? Uh, we, for example, to start with, we showed a prize-winning documentary about all segments of the value chain, um, because as you might imagine, it is not for granted that a woman a fish uh, trader inland knows very well how the life of a fisher on a boat actually happens and vice versa as well. So um, making, people appreciate their different roles and sharing a vision about uh, their daily realities and checking whether the documentary actually represented them was one of the elements to make sure uh, we were all on the same page. Um, likewise, um, uh, uh, and with the help of the FAO and uh, people participating in their regional uh, consultations, we made sure that uh, uh, people were briefed about what had been discussed. And um, so we went into great pains to make sure everybody had the same level of information. The director of fisheries had earlier explained what the government was up to. Um, and um, then the um, diverse experience and the broad possible uh, professional profiles uh, that were in the room in, uh, was enabled to develop some engagement and then to uh, come together and to translate the big goals of these guidelines into something that they could all experience on the ground. That was the ambition. So after this first uh, bringing everybody up to speed, uh, the rest of the consultation or the meeting was conducted very largely in small discussion groups. Um, around three questions. So what do I need to change to operate in my business uh, more sustainably? Uh, this concerned all of the people in the room. Um, what do I expect the academy to do? And what can I do as from now for the academy? Uh, so smaller group, conversations enabled everybody to speak up, to reflect deeply together about it and produce some answers to these questions. And then these answers, as you can see here in three different colors, were validated um, in, in the plenary. And that set the scene for actually getting started. Um, and um, so it, I think it's fair to say that the Academy articulates the global sustainable development goals and action and promotes action respectful of local populations concern. And it therefore celebrates local culture. It promotes active learning, uh, giving equal opportunities to all actors, men and women, 
and their communities uh, in the fisheries value chain. It contributes to co-production of adapted knowledge and local innovations that can be compared to the research result and be enriched by research results, et cetera, et cetera. But the emphasis is to catalyze synergies for tangible changes um, on the ground, uh, professionally uh, towards gender and blue social justice, and to connect in this way, the local concerns to global issues and vice versa. And um, uh, hopefully uh, enable robust solutions which work for the people and, uh, uh, and the planet. Um, let me now walk you a little bit through uh, some of the methods that enabled um, uh, this uh, to generate some results and support people on their uh, change journey uh, to improve towards improvement uh, at individual, uh, family, uh, professional, and, and community level. Um, as the title suggests, uh, the, particular emphasis is played on making them inclusive and tune them uh, for the adult uh, population of academy learners. Um, here we deployed uh, visual thinking uh, as a process of expressing thoughts and perceptions through images. Visual thinking strengthens strategic questioning by making the abstract concrete in the design, illuminating the relationships between the elements and simplifying complexities. Graphic facilitation provides individuals and groups with a variety of tools to help them understand complex concepts, relate things to one another, identify the essentials and improve dialogue by exploring ideas and integrate them towards uh, finding solutions uh, together more easily. The training methodology uh, applies a socio-ecological model inspired by a communication approach supporting social behavioral change. It engages participants in a gradual and multi-level change process, touching on individual, family, peer group, and societal spheres. Um, so how do we get started? Um, we have here, we start here with a vision. Um, and what is the vision where the facilitator was asking people, make a design, make a drawing of what you consider as a happy and a good life. Um, a vision of what is good for you is, um, provides a sense of direction. It motivates people uh, to actually spend time and energy towards um, achieving that vision. Um, discussing that with family, neighbors, and peers adds richness to the vision and can uh, add elements to the drawing. And it instills confidence about what this vision is. Uh, sharing a vision also reduces the risk of becoming isolated from one's uh, own reference group, from the, be it the family or professional association, and it lends strength to the ability uh, to bring about change for the better. That starts in everybody's mind as something that is, is feasible. The vision gives you the, the broad picture, but then how do you achieve the vision? 
um, the next step is to develop an annual plan for change or a drawing of a change journey. You see the canvas here, you describe, you draw where you are right now and where you think you could realistically be in one year's time. Um, and then you define quarterly uh, targets, intermediary targets of where you think you can be within three months, six months, and then the activities that allow you to achieve those intermediary targets. You will also want to think of any challenges along the road uh, that may uh, create obstacles. Um, a realistic, um, such a realistic action plan then generates a sense of purpose and um, at least some control over people's lives. Um, then there are other tools. Available for. Um, to support uh, dialogue uh, and reflection processes. Uh, one tool is the diamond tool. You see a diamond here. And it is divided into um, an upper part and a lower part. And um, it, it allows people to reflect, for example, on uh, what is uh, how they see their roles uh, either in, uh, in their profession or within the family and what they like about it, what they like a little bit less and what they don't like at all. And then it supports reflecting first individually and then as a group, uh, how to go about it. Uh, and as you see here, all these reflections start with the self at the center, but then branch out to family, uh, to uh, your professional group, say your savings group or uh, your fisherman's group uh, and to the wider communities. <clears throat> Once you have uh, done this sort of analysis, uh, you can also take uh, use other means uh, uh, of visual support to then uh, reflect a bit more, okay, I have identified a situation. Uh, what are the causes you, using the tree canvas? Uh, and in this particular case, I'm showing here, the tree canvas uh, was utilized uh, for um, reflecting on uh, gender relations and to, um, address some of the uh, issues that came out of the di diamond analysis. In particular, uh, a case of um, uh, domestic violence came to the fore and um, the tree canvas was utilized to reflect about uh, what are the, the, the root causes um, and um, what challenges, but also what opportunities existed so that the family tree could be strong and fruit bearing. And uh, to make sure as well that it was balanced between all genders and all family members so that it would not be pushed over by the first difficulties. So using, using uh, this imagery and these drawings, it was possible to address some of the more delicate and sensitive issues um, which people in families and communities need to address so that they can be on a success trip and make their um, improvements uh, stable and, and robust. And also 
built consensus around what is desirable and what is undesirable uh, behaviors and how they can eliminate um, undesirable ones and favor desirable ones. Let me introduce another tool uh, that was utilized to uh, support uh, the community's reflection uh, about how to improve conditions, this time along uh, value chains. Um, it usually starts again with individual and group con uh, conversations, identify um, who the actors are, where are they exactly, uh, what type of activities they carry out and how the activities affect other, other actors on the value chain. And then see whether uh, some of their um, activities have positive or negative uh, effects on others and um, how through better coordination and understanding uh, synergistic effects can be um, stimulated and, and improved. Um, so this shows quite, uh, I mean, this is, uh, let's say a first flavor uh, of uh, some of these um, uh, visual teaching methods. And um, one of the next steps is uh, to um, conduct uh, review workshops. This time, instead of projecting forward and looking what can be next steps, uh, academy le learners are invited to look back what they have achieved, what obstacles they have met on the road um, as a springboard to uh, develop updated and new plans. And because we all live uh, individual and family and community lives, um, here is a representation of uh, what is called the multi-lane highway journey. And uh, there, the same canvas you saw initially in a single dimension, it combines all three uh, and draws up what people have achieved on the different dimensions, individual, family, and community uh, as uh, essential steps to assess how they have been doing, how they have coped with uh, expected or unexpected obstacle and uh, <clears throat> how they can, can move uh, forward and planning for more advanced goals. Um, we, I mentioned in the beginning that um, uh, the academy is a multi-actor space where different types of uh, people can meet, uh, not only from within this small scale fisheries academy, but also people from outside who have an interest or who can be resource persons. And um, um, that all helps to diversify perspective. Uh, for example, here is uh, one example given uh, in, uh, with a resource person of who is a geographer and was uh, presenting some findings about climate change, allowing the people uh, in the working session to discuss what they had already experienced themselves and how they could, what strategies they could uh, develop to um, uh, respond, uh, avoid, mitigate, uh, adapt. And that uh, uh, can obviously uh, pertain to other important aspects, be it resource recovery, 
uh, and protection to sustain and uh, protect livelihoods into the future, um, access to market and credit, a recurrent theme, theme uh, particularly voiced uh, over and over by the women, uh, but also higher level objectives, uh, if you wish to participate in, in governance processes and lobbying the government or other uh, interest groups uh, so that the interests of small scale fishers get heard. Um, and uh, that is intended obviously to go beyond individual learners in the, in the academy, but um, with the newly acquired skills, um, encourage and support them to reach out into their professional networks, for example, engage with credit and saving groups and other organizations so that uh, the methods become available uh, to other people and the academy learners themselves become uh, multipliers within the communities. The tools uh, at disposal are strongly um, tilted towards uh, visual uh, supports, uh, but uh, and so we have also, for example, developed a, a, a version of a small video about the guidelines uh, in Wolof um, soundtrack to make to break down uh, any access barriers. But uh, you can think of theater, of role plays, of songs, and of many other ways uh, that enable people to engage actively in the topics so important for their lives. And then of course, uh, I should show at least a couple of results so far. Uh, and here is the, uh, Nabia uh, Ngom. Uh, she is a micro fish seller in uh, Yof, in, uh, outside of Dhaka, uh, the capital of Senegal. Um, and she has actually, uh, despite the pandemic, overachieved the objectives she set for herself. Um, she started actually out with selling only one uh, crate of fish per week. Uh, but uh, thanks to the planning methods she learned at, uh, in the academy, um, she uh, managed really to uh, market six crates as she had intended to. And not only that, but she uh, diversified into dried fish and she um, uh, put, was able to put aside enough money also to upgrade the roof of her house, uh, et cetera. And uh, it was beautiful to see how from somebody who was certainly in the lower end of the pecking order, uh, she emerged as a natural uh, leader who, who is consulted by others because of her success. Um, and so she can also um, serve as a, as a role model for other women uh, to do likewise. And uh, we all, and perhaps uh, if you have seen with the uh, invitation to the webinar, uh, there is a little um, a short, a four minute video that shows her success story. Um, other people, other learners of the academy also did quite well, uh, but in many different ways. Uh, for example, by diversifying from their um, uh, traditional activities during the pandemic uh, in branching out uh, into other, other forms of earning a living and uh, to doing comparatively well. Um, and then obviously, once you see it can work, uh, the motivation is strong to, to reach out into the wider networks and uh, share those methods and approaches with others to share the success and encourage them to, to do likewise. 
uh, and also to test scalability in other situations, other countries. Now, uh, that takes me to uh, a few take home messages. Um, and uh, so I would start by saying that high level analysis are essential for understanding the broad picture and the trends. So we need all the research we can get, but we also need to operationalize these results uh, and bring it down to the local level where people live so that uh, they can take full advantage. And we see that the global objectives like the SDGs and the SSF guidelines uh, may create a favorable framework, um, but that uh, they will not uh, be implemented uh, by themselves, but it, that it will take uh, people's engagement and practice and experimental work to make it work. Uh, we see that uh, the change journeys people engage in are fraught with unintended consequences. This should be not be surprising because in an interconnected world, you cannot um, be only a fisher. You are, uh, last year, you were confronted with a pandemic. We, are, we have still not overcome it. And so um, purely sectoral thinking uh, cannot um, help you master the challenges of the future and the opportunities. So um, the participation of diverse actors is uh, acts also uh, as an insurance because different people bring different types of knowledge that helps um, address unintended consequences and simply broaden the pool of experience and expertise uh, brought to uh, the fore. And um, let me underscore in this context that really citizens are the impact experts. While we do some of these uh, broader analysis, it is impossible from that level to anticipate all the implications, all the effects, all the impacts that this will have. While the people on the ground, they can fathom uh, how one or the other method will affect their lives. And um, so it's important that they can be part of that process and they have a say um, in how this is being played out so that when there are trade-offs to be made, these are done in a fair manner. In this conjunction, I think I cannot overemphasize that listening to the voices of men, women, and youth is super important. And that we are all learners in the process. We all know something, but nobody knows it all. And uh, so the, the uh, SSF Academy supports um, that different types of people can share their knowledge that uh, citizens can participate actively in different processes and uh, that they can uh, learn and gather experience in collective action thanks to respectful dialogue, harnessing multi-actor knowledge ecologies, um, self-confidence and trust. And supporting emergence of better innovative practices connecting local experiences to global goals. Um, it is important that we all as change agents, uh, we need to test and practice together to find out what will work best. Um, to close, I'll share just uh, a few um, uh, papers uh, on uh, the theoretical foundations for the practice. And I thank everybody for their attention and I'm more than happy to respond to any questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Cornelia. That was wonderful and lots of stories and uh, you know, lots of experience uh, that you said from your uh, own engagement in uh, building this academy with other partners and, uh, and colleagues in, uh, in Senegal and elsewhere. Um, we now open this up for um, uh, questions from our audience um, that is um, watching it live on YouTube. And uh, please write your uh, questions in the chat uh, on YouTube and we will make it uh, uh, available to uh, Cornelia and so she could respond. And we already have a few questions. Uh, the first one is from Kurban Arwani. Uh, and Kurban is asking, it would be useful to adopt a similar approach with regard to inland fisheries in South Africa and to include our constitutional imperatives in curriculum. We have a gap between our legislation, le legislation and the constitution, and most fishers are not aware of the rights uh, they have. Cornelia. Uh, yes, uh, we, I, I think uh, you raise a very important point there. Uh, we experienced exactly the same thing uh, in Senegal uh, and uh, in some other places where we have started uh, conversations in that direction. Uh, very often people are not aware of their rights. Um, and when the gap between uh, the, what they live through in practice and what their rights on paper are, when that gap is large, it is difficult to bridge. You need um, um, you need to build a bridge, uh, and that takes time, and it it needs a bit of encouragement so that people gain the confidence to walk on this bridge, and actually claim those rights, in in ways that are constructive. Um, I realize that also many governments are in a difficult spot. Um, there, there is legislation, there are regulations, etc. They want to do certain things, but they are also uh, subject to lobbying from different, often opposing interest groups. And um, there are uh, political, economic uh, ground realities, etc. It's not very easy and very often in, in those communities we have found that there is comparatively little um, administrations um, and so trust building and di let's say dialoguing in a respectful way is a way to build a little bit of trust without which it is hard to move forward because when we are in opposition to one another, a lot of energy is spent on, on fighting instead of looking for ways to uh, find trade-offs that are fair and acceptable. And some very often in the, we, we found it even in, at the small scale at which we have been operating, very often you find that uh, people draw red lines but once they start uh, a conversation and suspend judgment, uh, but listen to what the other people are saying, all of a sudden you can actually move the red lines and they are not red lines uh, so harsh as before. So, um, but the, the first uh, step is certainly to uh, make people aware what, uh, rights they have, what the rules are, and then uh, set up ideally dialogue processes where different views are respected and they are considered legitimate. We don't need all to have the same value systems, the all same knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if there is a respectful basis, there chances are that we can develop some road together. But, uh, you know, it, it's obviously uh, in, in a situation also historically laden, like in, in South Africa, it is, uh, it's easier said than done. But I think there, there are opportunities that can be created. Thank you. Thanks, Cornelia. The next uh, question is from Erwin uh, Prayogi uh, from Indonesia. 
And uh, Erwin is asking uh, if there is a role of the government, uh, uh, if they want to also contribute to the SSF Academy, uh, since the SSF usually become a marginal sector, especially as they are rarely uh, on different platforms uh, uh, with regard to the guidelines, especially, you know, so um, the role of government and how and what they can contribute is the question from Erwin. Yes. Uh, the guidelines themselves are very largely directed towards governments. Um, but uh, we see in practice that um, even with goodwill, a government can never do everything. And they, in some way, they need interlocutors as well. And building the capacities in those small scale fishing communities that people acquire the capacity to speak up, to uh, have a voice and to be active participants, even though sometimes in the beginning, it may not um, uh, look very attractive to the government. At the end of the day, I think uh, having strong um, interlocutors is uh, more, um, uh, makes it more probable to be able to move forward than if people just uh, are absent from the process. Because the, uh, we see that uh, if, if there is no participation uh, in some places, in remote places, for example, the, the government may not even have the cap capability to enforce all its rules because it's also thinly spread out in its in administrative structures. So we do think still that forms of respectful dialogues uh, are uh, at least enhancing the chances that one can move forward to better solutions. Thank you, uh, Cornelia, and thanks, Erwin, for that question. And the next question is from Inji Lee from Japan. And Inji is asking, this is such, uh, such an inspiring initi initiative. I would like to know how this SSF Academy is supported. Any support from the government? Um, thank you for the question. Um, the Academy uh, is attracts actually quite a, quite a bit of attention. Uh, at, at this point in time, we had the director of fisheries and some of his, his staff in the inauguration. They, they explained what the government's plans were already um, on the books. Um, and, but you know, some of the participants made it understood that there was a little gap between what the intentions were and what they were experiences on the ground. Um, at, up to this point, the government has not very actively uh, engaged with the, um, with the academy, uh, but we keep informing and the door is always open uh, for the government, for other uh, groups, uh, be it resource people or others. And um, so we think, uh, for example, uh, also through some of the um, FAO support projects for the guidelines, there is a constant encouragement to um, not be afraid to rub shoulders with civil society organizations and things like that. So I think it, it is important to keep working, showing that it's serious and it's not, it's not uh, aggressive or anything, it is really to, in, to support the, the common goal of implementing uh, the guidelines. Thank you again. And I have a question uh, uh, directly uh, through another chat uh, platform that I'm using, and it is from Derek Armitage in Canada. And, um, and Derek is uh, saying, uh, the idea of an academy is very empowering process to learn about. Are there specific features, institutional, social, and others that supported the academy idea? Can the model be re uh, rapidly adapted in other contexts? 
put another way, what are the crucial enabling conditions needed to support the SSF Academy? I think it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, it's, um, let's say, the, the methods we are deploying uh, have in some variation uh, and some adaptation from our side been uh, widely tested in rural contexts, for example, through participatory uh, action learning systems and then further developed into gender action learning systems uh, with Linda Mayu uh, and others. Um, they dwell on uh, art of hosting uh, technologies that, that foster dialogue between people to generate uh, uh, robust solutions. Um, and I think the, um, I think it would actually be very interesting uh, to uh, put in place other experimental academies in different places, uh, because I think it would be very interesting to see what is scalable. Uh, in other words, uh, it, we clearly put a lot of emphasis to ground the work in the local context and to give people the leadership in that. We are supporting, <laughs> we are facilitators more than anything else. And we are co-learners as well. Um, so, but if it works in one place, we cannot entirely be sure that it will work in another place. And we still need to understand what is generic in terms of the approach and that will fly in other places and what needs to be really locally tailored so that people can identify and feel empowered and, and uh, appropriate uh, that space for themselves. And so uh, I think that would be a very interesting thing, potentially also for V2V, because, um, you know, if we could compare several places, uh, it would be fantastic to, to understand a bit better what is generalizable and what needs to be highly site specific. Yeah, yeah, and there is always going to be some surprises that are very context specific, you know, that needs to be responded. Only practice, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. There are things you have to practice <laughs> yes. to test, yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, next question is from Anna uh, Carolina, uh, again from Canada. Uh, Anna is asking uh, or saying, thank you very much, Cornelia. Very interesting point that people are not aware of their rights. I would like to ask if you see power relations connected to the information flow. Uh, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, um, and and that is that is also why um, uh, I was mentioning in the latter part. Uh, one should not shy away from using all kinds of other means. You could think of rural radio, you could think of theater, uh, music, dance, role plays, uh, various things that, that resonate with local culture and can transport content so that people actually become aware of their rights and claim them and practice them. So uh, yes, and at the same time, I, I only I could only sketch really uh, the um, the case about uh, domestic violence. Uh, I mean, I know a number of other projects that I mean somehow the people uh, involved were confronted with it, but somehow the more conventional projects did not have the means to address this. And so long as you have that, it's very hard to to move forward because, you know, when the women are held back so much, uh, it's, you know, it, it, it just doesn't add up. Uh, and so um, there was the, these visual tools and starting from individual and same sex groups and then mixed groups discuss it in a very, very, um, um, let's say, 
careful and, and respectful ways, no, no tone of accusations or something like that. And, and uh, encouraging people to, to reflect and perhaps comment, but not pushing it too hard because obviously you don't want a backlash at home because you have been unsensitive about it. But I think these are, these are crucial things uh, if we want uh, these communities to move forward. And we see uh, in so many other movements right now, be it on the environment or other things, that uh, as women become more articulate, um, uh, these movements also get a new quality. They, they become more representative and they speak to more people. And that is a key to success, I think. So, but yeah, it's um, it's not a one size fits all. Huh? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't see any more questions. Uh, I just had a, a, a quick. Uh, I would not say question, but you know, kind of uh, um, curiosity that I wanted to ask you um, before we go to you know concluding it. Um, you know, I, I see the idea of an academy is a really powerful tool to build collaborations between different stakeholders and with, you know, and different actors, as you have mentioned. Uh, what would you have called it if not academy? You know, what, what kind of you know, prompted the notion of an academy as a terminology uh, instead of other terms that could have been used? <laughs> Yes, that's a good question, uh, Prati. Actually, you see, we wanted to honor the knowledge of the small scale fishers. They are very often left out of the equation or, you know, they, they are sometimes dealt with like a little bit like the dummies. Uh, yet in our fieldwork, and Aliu could probably go on for a long time with, on that, uh, we find that people are very knowledgeable, they are very experienced, but they have not perhaps had the benefit of a formal education. They, they express themselves in different terms, um, but they certainly could also contribute to research. Uh, we, we, in one of our joint publications, Aliu and myself, uh, he, he had done lots of uh, questionnaires and, and we were asking um, people, what is it you expect from research? What would you want to contribute as well? And uh, it was uh, quite interesting to see, even, even uh, again in the low, low in the pecking order, the women who scale the fish, who clean the fish in, in the landing place. Huh? And they would say, oh, we know the maturity of the fish. We touch the body, we will know the level of maturity. Now, ask your students <laughs> when they go out on boats to, to assess that. They slice the fish open to look at the roe and the milt. But these women, you know, just by daily practice would know what the uh, development state, the maturity state of the fish were. And I'm only citing that to say, you know, people do have a lot of knowledge. They don't have all it takes, but if we manage ways first to recognize, because otherwise they will not share. If they think they are put to one side, why should they share their knowledge? No way. Mm -hmm. So th that is one of the reasons. The, and it's actually the key reason. And also to indicate that we all need to learn. We are all learners. This is also why we, we speak of academy learners, but we include ourselves. Uh, you know, it's yeah. so that, that's why we, no. we want to affirm that these people have to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's a wonderful gesture where, you know, um, you know you're creating a, uh, you know, common platform. It's actually a melting uh, Hot, you know, where, you know, different interests, different expertise come in, you know, 
try to create something uh, really wonderful. Um, so that brings us to the end. I, we don't have any questions uh, uh, and everybody's saying huge thank yous to you on the YouTube and you can always go back and watch that. Um, so from our end, you know, thank you very much, you know, for making the time and uh, really, you know, starting a discussion on a new uh, our topic uh, within the V2B, you know, debates and also providing some uh, directions in terms of, you know, what can be done uh, in not, not only in terms of ideas, but also in terms of actions, you know, in our work uh, on small scale fisheries. So thank you very, very much, uh, uh, you know, Cornelia for that. Uh, before we end, actually, um, I would request um, um, Seville to bring up the poster for our next uh, talk, uh, webinar talk, which is going to take place on 26th November, which is the last Friday, as I said in the beginning. And uh, the talk would be by Dr. Jeremy Pittman from the School of Planning in uh, University of Waterloo, uh, an excellent scholar and, uh, and, and, and researcher that uh, engages in research around the world. Uh, Jeremy is going to talk about identifying entry points to enhance the adaptive capacity of small scale fisheries communities. Um, I think you know, he's going to take examples of small scale fisheries uh, from uh, his work in the Caribbean and uh, and other places, you know. So you're all welcome, and we look forward to seeing you in the next uh, webinar on 26th of November using the same link uh, uh, for live stream on YouTube. Uh, so thank you very much uh, once again to our speaker, Dr. Nuan, and uh, and all the audiences. Uh, and you know, we'll thank continue you this so discussion. Much. It was a great pleasure, privilege to be to contribute a little bit. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.